Good morning, good morning. Welcome to week number two of the Elf Code. How do you go from that type of worship to that video? Really rough. You just kind of have to. You just kind of have to do it. We are in week number two of the Elf Code, and I'll be honest with you. When it comes to Christmas music, carols, I'm not a fan. Uh, radio stations that switch over for the whole month of December, they get reprogrammed. I'll see you in January where you're no longer playing this music. But the thing is, how many here, if I just a round of applause, how many here really love Christmas music? Yeah! That wasn't an applause, that was a shout out. Those are two different things. So here's what I'd love to do right now. Everyone, if you have your cellular device, my kids still make fun of me because I call it a cell phone because there was a time where you only had pay phones and landlines. Anyone? Okay, there. So pull out your phones, open up to whatever social media that you want to, that you normally, last week I had so much fun uh, interacting with what people had to say about the question we asked last week. So here's what you need to do. Number one, check in to Navigation Church. Make sure to check in. But then here's the question I have for you. The best Christmas song ever is blank. And, well, that is, I don't know what to do with this. We want you to type it. That's the thing. Like, I appreciate the feedback, but it'd be kind of hard right now to talk to each and every one of you. So I already have mine done, and I'm ready to post it. Ready? Now, I added something to the end of mine. Because mine says, my favorite Christmas song is, but then the last sentence I wrote, tell me why I'm wrong. Just because, you know, I like to stir it up every once in a while. So I'm about ready to hit post now that I've checked in. My favorite Christmas song is Rudolph Has COVID by Dude Perfect. <laughs> and now some of you are sitting there going, I don't know that song. But I'll give you a hint. It's funny. Which is why I like it. So I'd love for you to check in, type in there, my, the best Christmas song ever is blank. And now Christmas song is going to be more about next week. So we've already covered this in the transition video. And oh, by the way, on our online campus, you are not excluded from doing this with us. We'd love for you to check in. We'd love for you to type in what your favorite Christmas song is. But this week, last week, here's just a little uh, screenshot of our elf in the classroom. Last week, it was treat every day like Christmas. And we talked about that. And the reason we celebrate Christmas, we have the mindset that Jesus actually came to earth. How awesome is this day? The fact is, God is still here with us every single day. And his name is the Holy Spirit. So we can treat every day like Christmas, and I'm excited next year uh, we're going to be doing, normally we do a 40-day spiritual campaign. I'll let you know now, next year we're doing a 40-day spiritual challenge. Yes, we're putting the word challenge to it, and we're going to be talking about the Holy Spirit for about seven full weeks, and we're just going to dive into more about who he is, what he is, and who, what he does for us today. And so every day like Christmas, today there's room for everyone on the nice list. And I'll talk to you about that in just a minute. But next week, I'm excited. The best way to spread Christmas cheer is to sing loud for all to hear. So I'll give you a hint. We'll probably be doing more Christmas songs, but we'll also have the kids in here with us for their, 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 their play. And if you're right now going, oh, do we have extra practices? Is there things we have to come to? No, just show up and we'll watch the train wreck together. It's just that we, kids don't need to be practiced. They just need to smile and we all love them. But next week, you better come ready to sing loud with them. And so they're going to be with us. And then December 25th, we will be here for a Christmas morning service. We're going to do it at our normal time at 955. But I'll let you know it's a family style, both the 25th and the 1st. Kids are going to be with us, families. We're just going to celebrate Jesus. We're not going to do announcements, and the cafe is not going to be open. You know what we're going to do? We're just going to make it about God. And so we want to invite you to come out those mornings with us and just celebrate not just the Christmas morning, but also our New Year's Day as we worship into our New Year's. And then January 8th, mark your calendars now. We're going to be sharing the vision of where we feel God's calling us to. And by the way, even in our worship times now, I can feel God stirring. And so excited about what the next couple weeks to have to hold for us. But now here's what I a thought that I had this week, and maybe I'm dead wrong. Uh, have you ever noticed how close or how many attributes Santa and Jesus share? And right now the answer is no. I know, right? I watch the faces of everybody just think, is he going to parallel Jesus and Santa? And sure am. Let's try this. 
Well, first of all, they both inspire people, right? When you think about Christmas time, when you think about Jesus, when you think about gift giving, when you think about Jesus, the greatest gift ever given, they inspire people to be better. I've never heard anyone say, I want to be selfish like Santa, right? It, 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 it's meant to inspire you. Uh, they're both known throughout the world, both Santa and Jesus. Doesn't matter your language, your tribe, your tongue. Here's what it is. You, you probably know about who Jesus and Santa both are. They both are welcoming and they embrace people to come to them. When it comes to Jesus and Santa, I think both of them have truths and myths that have been created all, over time. Now, the Santa truth and myth, myth, myths, it's easy for you to say, like clearly that's grown over time because St. Nicholas never climbed down chimneys, but the story of who he was and what he did. But the fact is that the myths about Jesus have all, all, also grown over time. There are truths about him. There are fictions about him. There are facts about the Bible. There's non-facts about the Bible. Here's one. I, I thought about this one this past week. How many have ever heard before, and this is Old Testament, that when the, the priest would go into the, the temple, the, high, the Holy of Holies, that they would tie a rope around his leg in case he was struck dead in the Holy of Holies so that they could drag him out? I mean, that is something that you've heard all the time. Here, here's the facts. That, that's no, nowhere in the Bible. And some of you right now, well, yeah, it probably is. Feel free to look it up, and when you find it, post this online. The best Christmas song ever is, because you're not going to find that. And you can say, well, maybe this is a tradition that was passed over time. The problem is the priest had a very specific ritual that they had to go through in order to go into the Holy of Holies, and tying a rope around their foot was not part of it. The thing that would have disqualified them to go into the Holy of Holies was a rope that they put as, as a safety measure. So there's myths that's been created over time. I, th I believe that both Santa and Jesus have been used and weaponized throughout the years. And here's why I say that. I remember years ago, there was a single mom, and I just happened to be around her, and the kid was acting up in the middle of December. And the mom looked at the kid, rather than disciplining the child, rather than correcting the child, the mom said this to the kid, if you don't start behaving, Santa won't bring you any gifts. Really? That's, that's the tool you're going to use for this? But if you think about it, how many times have we weaponized Jesus against people? Right? And I think it's all right for a parent to say something like, listen, the reason we don't do this is we don't want to offend our God. But when you use Jesus as the, hey, he's not going to love you because you're acting bad, I'm not sure that's fair to do to our Savior that died on a cross for us. And, and by the way, don't even bring up the Dark Ages and Crusades. So like, like at some point, we shouldn't weaponize who this person is. But then the other thing that I find very interesting is both Jesus and Santa, if you can say it this way, have a naughty and a nice list. Now, Santa's we know about because we sing this incredibly awkward song. I don't know if you've ever listened to the lyric. He's making a list. He's going to find out who's... Santa Claus is coming. Let's go one more. He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. Like Santa's this weird stalker that in nowadays would show up on a list and actually has to like check into the local police when he moves. Like this is a very weird lyrics if you actually look at it. But then he says this, he knows if you've been good or bad. Right? And so we know that Santa has this list of good or bad. But the fact is, in the Bible, it tells us, and by the way, this scripture, if you don't know it, it's going to seem hard-hitting when I first read it to you. In Revelation chapter 20, verse 15, it says this, Anyone whose name is not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. And there's a couple places where we actually see this through the word, but here's what we know. There's something called the Lamb's book of life. That in this, if you think about this, that when we die, we go to heaven, a massive book up here. And I don't know if this is how it works. I haven't been there yet, thank God. Like, but apparently, they'll go, last name, Amston, MMS, okay, grad oh, great, you're in this book, congratulations, you can come on in. Like, apparently, there's like this book of life that we want to have our name written in. But if your name's not written into life, there's a, 
eternity of damnation that you'd have to go to. And again, that sounds so heavy. And just to make a comment like that on a Sunday morning and move on, I would never want to just leave you confused. But the fact is, God wants to spend eternity with the people who love him. And if you don't love him, he's okay with you being away from him. And me personally, an eternity left to myself seems like hell because I know who I am. And so we want to be in this Lamb's Book of Life. But the question is, how do we get on the good list, right? How do you get onto this list? And so to do this, I want to talk to you out of Luke chapter 18 of a conversation that Jesus had with a certain man. Because this certain man, I think, falls into a lot of the thoughts, criteria, actions that we have in society today. And so if you have your Bible, open it up. If you don't know what a Bible was, Pastor Aaron showed it to you earlier. It's this paper thing that you flip back and forth. Uh, you can open up, if you want to open up our app, we have the sermon notes in there. Or you can just follow along with me. And it's Luke chapter 18, verses eight, uh, verse 18 through 27. It says, a certain ruler asked him, good teacher... What must I do to inherit eternal life? Or for today's conversation, can we rewrite that a little bit? Can we say this? Hey, good teacher, I would like to know how to get on the nice list. Does that make sense? Can you kind of see the parallel that I'm drawing there? Like, I want to know how to get on the nice list. And Jesus immediately says to him, why do you call me good? Which, by the way, if you don't know anything about Jesus, he could actually have that title. Right? Jesus, for those who don't know who Jesus is, I'm just going to take a minute here to give you a quick review. All of humanity was underneath this curse, this sin nature. Because way earlier, 4,000 years earlier, Adam and Eve, the only two people on the planet, had to do one thing. Anything they wanted to except eat off of one tree. And they decided to be their own judges. They decided to determine right and wrong for themselves, hence introducing sin into the world. And Adam and Eve had babies, and so those babies were under the same curse. They were born into sin. And then those babies had babies, and they were born under sin. Fast forward a lot of generations. If every generation just keeps reproducing sinful people, all of us were born underneath sin right? It is, we, we know this. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But Jesus came along, and this is why we celebrate Christmas. And if you want to know more about how this came about, join us December 25th, and I'll give you a little bit of a history lesson. But there was a time where we as a people had to know why we were celebrating the virgin birth. The virgin birth was because there was a whole new seed line introduced to the world. That was, ready for this? It was good. It was sinless, but in my opinion, when I read this, this certain ruler came in asking the question the way that he did, making assumptions that he should just be on the nice list. And Jesus made it very clear, there is no one good but God. And Jesus didn't separate himself. He made that a blanket statement for everyone. So here's what we all have to do. We have to assume we start our life on the naughty list. And you could say, well, why would we assume that? And actually, this is where our faith comes in because our faith tells us that we were born sinners. And so let's, as of right now, unless you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, the book of your life is filled with nothing but sin. But the moment you say yes to Jesus Christ, your book is still what it is, except the binding changes. And God covers you with a new cover, and that is the cover of Jesus Christ. Now, as you continue to write chapters, those chapters need to change. You can't still like, live like hell expecting to go to heaven just because you say you know Jesus. That would be like saying, I know who my wife is, but I don't spend any time with her, I don't give to her, and I don't care about her. Well, great. I know my wife, but don't be surprised when we get a divorce. Because there is no relationship, right? And so Jesus, the first thing we have to understand on making the nice list is understanding that we were born onto the naughty list. This seems like a really depressing sermon for a Christmas morning. Oh, we have two more weeks. We're good still. Okay. So Jesus said, why do you call me good? Verse 19. No one is good except God alone. Verse 20. You know the commandments, and this is Jesus talking to the certain ruler he, you should not commit adultery, you should not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your mother and your father. And then this certain ruler, here was his response. 
All of these things have I kept since I was a boy. And I would think the next sentence would be, no, you haven't. Right? Because, listen, I know that I'm an amazing person. You don't have to say amen or respond at all. Just awkwardly look at me with a single slow clap. (laughs) Sarcastic single slow clap. Demoralizing single. Okay, okay, okay. But I can guarantee you this. I've never always honored my mother and father. I've never always not given false testimony. I was a kid once. I stole. I'm sorry. I don't think I've committed murder because I left the scene really quick. No, I like. (laughs) But I can tell you this. I've never physically killed anybody, but verbally, I definitely have. (laughs) Right? Because I think... This thing that we read says that this tongue is a sword. And as much as I would like to say I've spoke life, I know that I spoke death. And in my mind, it was a really good death. Like I let them have it. Like, it was, you know, he, they ran into my knife. They ran into my knife 17 times. And I can even quote Chicago from the stage, and none of you would know that. And if you are, I'm sorry that I offended you. But, like, I know that I uh, did that. Commit adultery? No, I've never cheated on my wife. Wait a second. I remember when I was younger, man, did I look at porn a lot. And the scripture says that if you even look upon them with lust in your heart that you've committed, daggone it, man. I'm 0 for 5. So here's what we're going to do now. We're going to go one at a time. And I'm going to ask you how you've been doing on this list. Okay, now people are saying no. Now you're responding. I appreciate that. But here's the thing. This guy said that I've done all of these things. And Jesus' response to them, he said, instead of saying, no, you haven't, he goes, but you're still lacking one thing. So in Jesus' mind, this guy must have been enough of an upstanding, righteous, understanding the Torah, that he probably did do a lot of good works, thinking I've done enough good works that I deserve to be on the nice list. And Jesus is about to show us this. You can do all the good works you want in your life, but you can never earn your way onto the nice list. You cannot earn your way on the nice list, lest any man should boast And you go, why did he just say the phrase, lest any man should boast? That almost sounds like a King James, it is. It's a King James version of saying this, that if I could earn my way, then somehow I can actually be more righteous than you, right standing. Jesus wants to put us all on the same level, all on the same playing ground. And the fact is, you can give all your money away. You can do nothing but serve the people around you. You can actually be a sacrificial human, but you can never qualify to be the sacrificial lamb. And so for you martyrs out there that are trying to be the savior for everyone... May I serve you today and help you today to say this. You were never called to be everyone's savior. You can serve them and you can help them. But in every situation, you have to turn them back to Jesus eventually. Because Jesus is the only one that makes you on the good list. And so what Jesus says to him is he goes, hey, you're still lacking one thing. Do me a favor. Go sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and then you'll have a treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. And I know so many times, excuse me one second, I'm going to. I know, and I've heard before, people, pastors use this scripture as a part of like an offering or a tithe, first fruits, like to encourage people to actually give money to the church. And I would say this, I think that may be using it a little bit out of context. And when I say a little bit out of context, like totally. (laughs) And I'm sorry, and if you've preached that before, before, just know, you may feel like I am murdering you with my tongue right now, but I'm not. This had nothing to do with the guy had too much money. Because here's the fact about rich people in the Bible. There are rich people that are godly, and there's rich people that are ungodly. It doesn't matter. And ready for this? There are poor people that are godly, and there are poor people that are ungodly. It wasn't a monetary thing. 
What Jesus wanted this guy to say is, I'm not satisfied with most of your life. I want all of your life. You don't make it onto the nice list because you tell God, I'm willing to give you my soul. I'm willing to tell you yes in my spirit, but the rest of my life is the way I want to live it, how I want to live it, when I want to live it. Jesus is inviting all of you onto the nice list. And so if you believe that you were saved only because you come to church on a Sunday morning, but then you leave and for the rest, the other six days and let's go with 22 hours, you never talk to God. You never think about God. You never worship God. You never read to God. You never pray to God. You never do anything. I would say Jesus would say this to you, give up other parts of your life. Because my job as a pastor, like in my job description, in the book of Ephesians, it says this, that my job is to train and equip the saints, which by the way, in case you don't know this, that's you, like if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, train and equip the saints for the work of the ministry, which means every place that you go throughout the day, I, there's no way we can hire as many staff that we want. There's no way we can touch the amount of people that you can touch, talk to the amount of people you can touch, have interactions with the amount of people you touch. But what if every one of us left here today thinking this in my mind, tomorrow when I go to my job, I'm going to do everything I can to showcase Jesus Christ. Tomorrow when I'm having an interaction with my family and my kids are misbehaving, rather than saying Jesus isn't happy with you, what does it look like to say here's what Jesus looks like inside of you? And so my job is actually to train the saints for the work of the ministry and where you should go. And in doing that, you cannot be a Christian and only attend a church every once in a while and just say, my ticket is punched. There's no tickets, there's only list. And to get on your list, what Jesus is telling us here is he wants all of your, he's not satisfied with part of your life, he wants all of your life. Could you imagine if Jesus only gave part of himself on the cross? He gave all of himself. And I know this is, by the way, this is not in the Bible. This, I feel like I should step off stage to tell you this part. This is just me. In my mind, when Jesus died, the reason he died is because every last drop of blood was drained from his body. He gave it all in order for us to have the opportunity to even make it on the nice list. And by the way, that thought I don't think is biblically correct or incorrect. This is just, it's the way I think about the sacrificial gift that Jesus, he held nothing back. And so Jesus said, go sell everything, give it to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. And when this certain ruler, when this man heard this, became very sad because he was very wealthy and there were things in his life that he just didn't want to give up. There were aspects of who he was that he liked. And can I even go a step further? There's aspects of us that we like because we think it works really well for us. Right? You can, so, so you think you're a good businessman or woman, but the fact is you're a little deceptive in your workings. But since you always come out ahead, you're okay being a little deceptive. Right? And Jesus is going, no, no, no. I want you to give all that up to us. You look great in public. You dress well. You smile big. But the fact is your kids don't even like you. And what do you do then when you just go, wait a second, I want your whole fatherhood to come underneath me. I want your whole marriage to come underneath me. And so Jesus said this. He goes, how hard is it for a rich man or for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it's actually easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. This it commonly, this I've actually seen, if, if you Google this, you'll find a picture. How many have ever worked with a needle before and you have that little hole that you're supposed to thread, supposed to, supposed to thread through, right? So this picture of an, you know, like threading a camel through a needle, you go, well, that never works. Actually, this is a picture in Old Testament, or not Old Testament, New Testament too. So cities, in order to protect themselves, they would build these massive walls. And at night, they would close up the gates in order to, so uh, robbers and other kingdoms couldn't just come in and start pillaging and, and destroying the city. But they would, in every gate, leave a doorway big enough for people to just be able to come out, and this was e easy to protect. This was known as the eye of the needle. 
So if you happen to be a merchant late at night coming into a city and they had already closed the gates, the only way for you and your product, you and your camels, you and your stuff to get in is they would have to unload the camels from everything that was on top of them Get the camels down on their, like, legs, and I, I can't bend my legs like them. You probably know what a camel, I don't know why I'm doing this right now. So the camels would have to get on their knees and come through. Could you imagine how hard it would be to get a camel to come into your front door? But the only way to actually make it achievable is to unload all the stuff that that camel's carrying. Jesus today wants to help you unload from all the stuff that you are carrying. He wants you to unload all those merchandise, all the stuff that you think makes you, all the stuff that you think you need in order to have impact in the world around you. Sometimes you just got to strip it all away and say this, God, I just love you for you. Not because of what I bring, not because of who I think I am, not because what I deserve to have. I want to just love you because of you. And so I'm willing to have all of that stripped off of me, come down low before you in order to enter into the place that you've called me to. And those who heard him goes, so how is it we get on the nice list then? Like, how is it that we get saved? And Jesus replied this, what is impossible with man? What is impossible with your genealogy because of the sin nature that you're in? What is impossible with you doing enough nice things? What is impossible for you to almost give some but not all to Jesus? What's impossible with man is possible with God. And here's how it's possible. We believe that Jesus Christ is the one who puts us on the nice list. And you want to talk about taking pressure off of us. Nowhere are you going to find in the Bible where God calls you to be perfect. But everywhere he calls you towards perfection. And it's interesting because we always talk about, I can't, I, I'm, I'm going to maybe offend someone here. Not my goal. Just going to throw this out. How many times have you heard someone say, God's a loving God. God's a loving God. God's a loving God. Right? We all is about God's love, God's love. Would you like to know the amount of times that God is called love is less than five, but the amount of times that he's been called holy is more than 40? God's a holy God. And this holy God calls you towards perfection, but his love is what paved the road for us. If you want to be on the nice list, it's moving towards holiness. It's moving towards right living. And so next week, I have a feeling, or not next week, let me say that better. Not better, I said it completely wrong. <laughs> next year, I have a feeling you'll start hearing some questions a lot more often. But I at least want to introduce it to you right now because I think it will help us get on the nice list. But we also have to remember the point of this sermon is there's room for everyone on the nice list. But there's no way you're inviting someone to the nice list if you're not even on it. So, here's a question for you. This past week, how did you feed your soul? How did you strip the stuff off of your camel back and feed your soul? Right? Question number two. This past week, how did you feed your flesh? What are those places in your life you know you shouldn't, but you did? And see, I would love to tell, tell you that I'm up here preaching from a power perspective on this, but the fact is, this is a question that I have to ask myself all the time still. Because what I found in my life is, more times than not, when I'm trying to, if there were two lists up here, the naughty list and the nice list, when I know there's something on the, which, was this the naughty list? I forgot already. I knew I should have got a little props for myself. Naughty list and nice list. No, naughty list has to be on the left side. Sorry, that's, yeah. it's the left side. It's the left side. Right side is nice list. So the naughty list, when I don't want to be on the naughty list, and I know I need to be on the nice list, I need to be on the right-hand side, how often I, and by the way, this is just me. This may not be you whatsoever. When I don't want to be on the naughty list, or if there's something in my life I don't want to do, I focus more on what I don't want to do than who I want to be. And here's the crazy thing. Psychology tells us this. When you focus on the thing you don't want, 
More often, you solidify the belief system in your life because you spend more time dwelling on that versus what you want. And it, there's no different. You remember when you went to driver's ed? Some of you are a little bit older. Driver's ed, that was when you had to get out and crank your car and it turn on. For I mean, I know it's been a while, but like, oh, yeah, yeah so mad at me. So, okay, no, congratulations, you just made the naughty list. So, like, Jesus put you on it. Uh, like, okay, so, like, when it comes to this, do you remember in driver's ed, they would tell you don't focus on the parked car. Right, because you're driving down the road. If you don't focus on the parked car, where's your focus going to be? The parked car. And next thing you know, you're driving towards the parked car because where your vision is is where you'll naturally follow. But if you want to be, if you want to learn how to live on the nice list, if you want to learn how to live in that land books of life, if you want to learn the better things about who you are, at some point, how about? And by the way, I got me. How about I stop focusing on the things I don't want and I focus on who I want to become? And I know in my life, I know in my life, there are times that I'm actually focusing on not being on the night or not focusing on the left side on the naughty list out of a spirit of fear versus being driven to live on the right side out of the spirit of God. And so literally the spirit that's driving me is the very spirit that I want to be away from. And my focus is don't be on the naughty list. Don't do these things in your life. Don't act this way. Don't say these things. Don't think versus just saying, God, I want to strip all those things away. Tell me how to live. Tell me how to look. Tell me how to speak. Tell me where to move to. And somehow these things over here become a distant memory because I'm so focused on who I'm supposed to be on the nice list that I'm no longer even embracing or focusing or moving towards the naughty list. But every time we feed our flesh, we look left. Every time you go back to this thing, you move to the left. And then you wonder to yourself why I'm here. So here's what we do as Christians. Here's what we do as followers of Jesus Christ. We beat ourselves up because we think if we do this self-flogging thing, Jesus will be happy with us. But we forget the fact that there's nothing you can do to get on the nice list. Isn't it weird to think that we know we can't make it on the list by doing good things, but somehow if we do these self-beating things, God will be pleased with us? And maybe this isn't you. Maybe this is just me and everyone I've ever talked to. Have you ever heard someone say, I'm having trouble talking to God right now just because of who I've been and what I've been doing? The naughty list is welcoming you at that point. Where the nice list is sitting over here just going, talk to me. There's nothing you can do that makes me get off the cross and set everybody but you. So question number one, how did you feel, feed your soul? How did you focus on that? Question number two, how did you focus on the naughty list by feeding your flesh? But then here's the third question, and this is for all of us today. How did you feed others? I think this is a great question because it doesn't say how did you feed them good or how did you feed them bad. You have to determine that. But if you're living on the nice list, I don't know about you, I want everybody I ever interact with to be on the nice list. I want to, them to experience this greatest present that's ever been given. And it's not because Amazon delivered it. It's not because it's the fastest new iPhone. It's not because of that. It's because when they close their eyes for the final time, everything here on earth does get stripped away. And you're going to be either left with self or you're going to be left, left with Savior. So where am I intentionally feeding the soul of others? And right now, you're, you're starting to think like, you know, people you've been evangelizing and different ones at work. Let's go all the way down. How'd you do with your spouse? How'd you do with your kids? Have you murdered anyone this past week? Have you committed adultery? I didn't cheat on my wife. No, but that computer screen, that phone, how did you feed others this week? 
And I want to encourage you during this holiday season, do not just look of what you can give naturally to someone in your life around you, but what can you give them spiritually? And the greatest gift that you can give anyone is the gift of Jesus Christ. So if you don't know how that looks, I'm just going to explain it to you really quick. In my life, there was a time that I had to make a decision. I grew up as a PK kid. If you don't know what that is, it's a pastor's kid, right? Some people say we're the most misbehaved kids ever. Amen. <laughs> Sorry. I know my brother and sisters. They are horrible people. And so, <laughs> with that said, <laughs> and no mic in their hand, um, there came a time in my life where I had to decide if I believed in the spirit realm. I had to believe if there was a higher power or not. I had to believe, if I can say it this way, I had to believe if there was a God or if this theory called evolution was true and we're just all here by chance and by accident. And in that moment, I remember saying to God, I'll give you a chance to touch my life. And it happened to be my father who was praying for me. He prayed for me and he went down the line praying for other people. And I remember being disappointed because I didn't feel anything. I didn't sense anything. I didn't get like this awakening. And I said to God, I go, I guess you made it very clear that you weren't interested in giving this gift to me. And in the middle of that disappointment, my dad stepped back and my natural dad hugged me, but my heavenly father embraced me. And I absolutely knew that God was real. And by the way, if anyone ever asks you the question, how do you know that God is real? I would say, how do you know that love is real? Outside that it's been expressed to you. And my God expressed to me who he was. And on that day, I decided to follow him. And so this manual that he leaves for us, I'm walking this way real quick. Sorry, guys. We're not supposed to go outside the light, and I just did. I picked up his manual, and I decided I'm going to do the best that I can to live according to the principles he told me. And so I started getting into this. I started reading it. Even college-wise, I earned something called a master's degree, and I don't know what that even means because I don't feel like I'm a master of this thing at all. And I just started following Jesus to the best of my ability. If you want to know how to give the gift to someone else, let me ask you this. What's your story? Because that's how you tell them. Now, I'm going to do the same thing if I was one-on-one -on -one with you or in a group setting. If you're here today... And somehow as I've been talking, there's something welling up inside of you. There's something in your head saying, yes, there's more. There's something inside of you going, listen, I don't fully understand the naughty nice list, but I don't like the thought of being by myself for eternity because me to myself sounds like hell. I want to be with God. I'm going to make this very simple invitation. Say yes to Jesus today. Say yes to this word. Say yes to the promise. But bigger than all of this, say yes to the gift. The gift is this, that 2,000 years ago, born unto us this day in the city of David, to a virgin, was born a savior. And his name is Emmanuel. God fleshed, lives with us. And it wasn't to play with us. It wasn't to talk to us. Ultimately, it was just to die for us. And if you believe that he died for you to shift you from a naughty list to a nice list, in your heart if you believe and in your mouth you confess it, you are saved. So this morning, could, actually, let's do this real quick. If you're in an online campus, or if you're sitting here with me now, could I just ask everyone to close your eyes? That may feel weird and you're like, well, I don't do these church things. But here's, you're just closing your eyes because I want you to know no one else is looking at you. No one else is paying attention to you. You are by yourself. And let's say this, I'm a dad. I'm a father walking in front of you today. And the question is, do you want your heavenly father to embrace you? 
And if you're here today and you want to say yes to Jesus Christ being your Lord and Savior, if you're saying yes, I believe I have an eternal soul that I want saved. If, if you believe that Jesus died for you on the cross, by the way, eyes are closed right now. Most heads are even bowed. I'm talking to just you. If you're here today and you're ready to say yes to Jesus, could I just invite you to raise your hand into the air so that I can see that you've made that decision? I see hands all over the place. I won't even say it. I see those. I do. I see those hands. I see those hands. Now, the scripture says, if we believe it in your heart, the moment you raised your hand, for those online, the moment you said yes by raising your hand or maybe clicking a button or liking a thumbs up, whatever that might have been, your hands went up, it believed in your heart. Now, let's confess it with our mouth. And instead of you feeling like you're alone, could I ask everybody in this room to say this with me? Dear Jesus, today is the day that I'm ready for the nice list. Not because of what I've done or who I am, because of what you did for me. Forgive me of my sins. Become Lord of my life. And from this day forward, I follow you. God, I thank you for every hand that went up. I thank you for every mouth that confessed. I thank you for everyone in our online campus that received this gift today. Now, God, let us receive the gift of eternal life and the promise, Holy Spirit, that every day can be like Christmas. Tomorrow, we can wake up with you close to us. Next year, we can know that we've moved closer to you. And I just pray that lives are changed today because we understand the gift that was given to us 2,000 years ago. Lord, I just pray right now, I've just I've been feeling this this morning. I pray that as we move into this holiday season, there are those that maybe because of deaths and days gone by, maybe because of broken families and friendships, that they are not looking forward to this season. God, I pray that this season become a season of joy, unspeakable joy, the joy that overwhelms our soul. Because rather than focus on the credit cards, rather than focus on the obligations, rather than broke, focus on, if I can say this, that left side naughty list. God, we focus on you this year. I pray for those of you that are worried, concerned, anxious about this Christmas season. I pray today it shifts because your perspective has shifted. And to use the old cliche, we now know the reason for the season. I speak a peace upon your life. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.